Margaret's working from the home broadcast studio today. I'm Richard Carthen, creator of FM Training TV. If we go to the FM Training.tv website, Margaret, then we can take a look at the upcoming broadcast schedule. Jacob Taylor is here. A lot of people here with us today. Rick Kalman is a product manager from Claris is here to discuss backlog changes that have occurred immediately and kind of give us a little bit of a synchronized between the community and what Claris is doing. And so I am here at Claris today, live from Claris headquarters. And the idea is, once again, my job here, as much as anything else, is to help um, improve the communicate level of communication between the community and Claris. I think Claris is mostly aware of what your concerns are, but my job is to help as they make decisions they and they go in certain directions to make sure that makes it as rapidly as possible back to the community. Um, it's important for you to understand what the community or what the what Claris is doing for all of you. So today is talking about Claris' backlog, which is a fancy way of saying this is their to-do list. So let me pivot real quick. And so I want to introduce Rick Cam. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, what we're going to do momentarily here. But Rick is, uh, so you are one of the directors of product management at Claris, right, Rick? So can you give us a real quick rundown for people who don't know who you are? I'm one of the directors um, of product management at um, Claris, and my primary focus is on the FileMaker platform. Uh, I have been um, at Claris or FileMaker since August of 2000, so almost 24 years. Um, and of that, 19 years as a product manager um, in various roles um, uh, with most of my career uh, focusing on FileMaker Pro, but I've, I've done server and cloud and other things as well, and then began managing product managers, which is a different discipline than being a product manager. Um, but uh, sort of like herding cats, uh, Margaret, um, <laughs> with 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 an unfenced yard. With an unfenced yard. With monkeys trying <laughs> to um, be the ones that uh, are hurting them. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, and only ones worse are designers. But, um, but I just um, sort of. Anyway, that's that's who I am. Yeah, so real quick. So for those of you wondering about Rick, why he has such high straight uh, credibility is, A, uh, before he worked at Claris as a PM and all this sort of stuff, he was a senior level developer. So you saw that graph just a moment ago. He was very up there in that senior ninja level. He's a serious code monkey back in the day. So he knows what it is to do our job. He understands why the product's important, how it's important. Him and a handful of people at Claris are really the most valuable assets because they understand, they do what we do. Um, and without them, there would be no one in the building to communicate what the developers actually do. So it's very important. I remember Rick's first day at, or when he was coming into interview, I was there for helping one of the departments do something. And I was in the lobby waiting to get in and he was in there. We're like, hey, who are you? I'm Rick Hellman. It's like never, never in a million years we realized in 20 some odd years we would be back here doing live streams. So let me pivot into practical material for today. So I'm going to share my screen, and then Rick is going to mostly talk about this. And so what this is all about, for the most part, is this idea of this Claris product backlog. And so it's it's kind of like the things that they have, they have in progress, major initiatives they have in progress, major things they're working in the backlog. And I would only caution everyone that there's two of these. And the first time that Claris talked about this was that engaged. So this is all fairly new. If you haven't seen or heard us talk about this before, I can understand why that is. This was kind of rolled out to the community essentially back in February, March, whenever Engage was. And so there's a product backlog, which is the engineering, product management side of things. It's really for the stuff that most of us really, really care about. There's also a marketing backlog, which looks just like this and it has the same kind of initiative but it's run by the marketing demand generation team so as marketing has different things they're doing like success stories and things like that people can upvote be aware of what they're working on so this today is the product backlog plan and the first question and i warned rick this was going to happen the first question i have is that really the things on here are the things largely the things that are done maybe might be pointed out that they're done but they have kind of drop off the list because they've been delivered right and so yes yeah. So um, as, as Rich said, um, or at least alluded to, um, during the Engage conference in Austin back in early February, um, during the keynote, we announced this and we made it live. And our intention is on a, approximately a quarterly basis to update it. Um, but there were other times where, where we'll get to it sooner. I'll tell you a bit that in a second. So 
what we've done is gone in and there are 16 new items that you're going to find appearing on this bag log uh, from the original one. Um, 12 are new that you'll see in the in progress um, section, which is the, the first part of that. We've added two new items to the backlog, which is this. The, so essentially in progress means we're working on it. And our intention is it's going to ship imminently when the next release comes out. Um, backlog is the stuff setting behind that that's prioritized, that we move far enough along that we have some uh, bullishness that those will move into in progress. Uh, and then we've added two items to a new um, section that we added called delivered. So we have a couple of items that were already delivered. We want to point that, that out as well. What I expect is within a few weeks, we'll have yet another update. Um, and you'll see a massive chunk of the in-progress move to delivered because it meant that we ship the next release, which happens to be FileMaker 2024. That will be uh, the exception. But what it will try to do is I keep try to keep track of stuff that we, we didn't catch or uh, maybe we should have had there in the first place. The, the, the reality is, there's so many things that that we're doing simultaneously. I've got to make a cut of you know what are the the most salient to talk about. Um, for instance, you know this next release you're going to see between server and pro approximately 200 uh, customer impacting in market bug fixes. Um, but you just can't go through that that kind of a um, uh, laundry list. So anyway, um, Rich, what I'll do is I'm just going to walk through the additions. Um, and then I'll leave it up to you to decide, do we interleave questions um, as they yeah. arise towards the end? Yeah. But I'll just Margaret that can help with that. Question. Margaret, yeah. if you have uh, on-topic questions, please ask us, right? So once again, let me just emphasize for everyone that, so imagine this is a database, okay? <laughs> this is the overall topic category, and this is the status of the item right above it, right? So imagine we're all database people. We understand that's a status report. In progress loosely means that they're actively coding it, and it will be theoretically in the next release version, loosely, right? I I, I think for the most part, that's an accurate statement. So, um, so we're going to start here at the top and work our way through this, um, and I'll let you kind of drive the conversation. Sure. Uh, so real quick, sure. let's talk about upvoting real quick so we can just cover this. So. Part of this is us telling Claire's what we think is important, right? And so uh, in order to vote, you need to log in. So you can see up here, I'm logged in. Um, you would log in and you, 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 it doesn't do Claire's any good for you to upvote everything. Cause it's like, I like everything. It's under, I want it all tomorrow, right? The idea is for you to prioritize the things that you, to you or your organization are more important, right, Rick? Um, Cause what Claire's is looking for is a, a is a, like for future items, like backlog items, which we'll get down towards the bottom, what are the hotter items that we care about as developers? They're tr they're looking for a difference, like clearly 40 points versus 1.4K points, right? Those are big differences here. So this is clearly more popular, this one versus this one. If Claris was going to choose, and, and clearly in progress, they're past that, they're building it. But clearly, if they had to choose between these two, this one would be more valuable, at least from the community perspective. So I will give a, a caveat that um, the very first one, ODATA 4.0.1 compliance, we just added that today. So um, it hasn't had a chance to work its way up through the upvotes, up um, um, but but over time, they, they pretty much even out and it is very useful information to us. So I'll just start with the first one. So you may be aware of um, a few releases ago, we've introduced the ODATA, which is RESTful API way of essentially doing what you can do with ODBC. Um, we work with Jonathan Monroe of Actual Technologies, who created our um, ODBC drivers. Uh, and he is also the one creating the, the ODATA um, uh um, APIs. Uh, and so we have been working towards ODATA 4.0.1 compliance. And I say working towards because when we ship the next release, um, will there be one or two things that we don't yet um, comply with, but we will continue um, to, to follow up on that in the, in the next update. Um, but essentially, um, this, this feature allows developers to take advantage of the latest OData standard, um, which is open data protocol. Um, it's essentially a web protocol um, built for consuming RESTful APIs over the web, which is a lot of, of what we've been moving to over the years. It's platform ag agnostic. 
It allows interoperability um, across platforms and technologies. Um, as far as querying, it supports querying capabilities, filtering, sorting, uh, paging directly in the URL. Um, and it's um, it's standardized. It's part of the OASIS uh, standard um, and help ensure consistency and interoperability. So why does this make your life better? So what we're doing here in trying to make get compliance with 4.01, and then, of course, they'll be a new standard and we'll constantly be chasing standards because they always evolve. It's more suited for building web APIs and accessing data over the web. Um, ODBC focuses on providing connectivity between relational databases, but the enhancements we make to ODATA makes it easier to integrate FileMaker with other application and services. So it's, it's more versatile. Um, then ODBC, it doesn't uh, require installing drivers, which is really nice. You just call the API and it's very powerful. So that's the first one that, uh, that we've added. Uh, the rest are, are the same, Rich. Um, that there's a couple of more that we have added under the service uh, server enhancement section. So if you um, go down to uh, server enhancements, the first one is um, we're extending the FileMaker Admin Council GUI to show all the backups on disk, not just the FileMaker server backups. I, um, I need to stop. Yeah, just stop. Yeah. I need to upvote this immediately without delay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's already climbing. Jacob Taylor, I know, is going <laughs> to upvote this 12 times. Jacob, you can only vote once. So right. this extends the FAC GUI to show all backups on disk. It provides um, more visibility and control over FileMaker server backup system. And why does this make your life better? It now allows you to, to quickly view, edit, label, preserve, filter backups by label, delete preserved backups, generate uh, backup schedules that you've, uh, uh, are generated by backup schedules you've created. It gives you just more flexibility in managing the server backup system. So um, we have gone into the admin console and trying to make it better to do some of the work that you need to do and, and give it a, some, some uh, GUI as well. And that is um, sort of uh, consistent with this next one, which is revamp server admin console schedules. This is a pretty significant um, update to um, how you administer um, schedules on server. So server admins have been requesting this for, um, for, for, for a while, and we've collected these together, and um, this applies to both the UI and the FileMaker server admin console, as well as the cloud admin console. The primary enhancements here um, include sorting and filtering of schedules, additional columns that so you can sort and filter and search on, and approved UI for selecting schedules. And so... The list of why this, this is better uh, is pretty long. And so it's maintaining feature parity uh, with the existing server and cloud um, um, uh, UI and, and APIs uh, for the admin consoles for both of those. Um, uh, and, but we're optimizing and reducing the redundancy in, in scheduling and sorting and filtering and UI. And, and we would have you know some of your backups and schedules are over here and some are over there. So. Um, we've updated the following things. You can double click now to edit a schedule. You can dynamically select columns in, in, in the schedules grid and, and you can move them around to get them exactly where you want and we'll remember where you put them. Um, you can um, duplicate multiple schedules at once if you want to do that. Um, you can create custom schedule filter column if, if you want to do that. You can sort your schedules. You can search your schedules. You can um, you can schedule, um, uh, the, uh, you have a, a column for scheduled status. You can run, you can do run now on multiple schedules at once. And then there's a various interface improvement. This is something that's very GUI intensive. You have to take a look at, but if you've ever spent time, uh, here in this area, it, you'll, it'll be a pretty uh, great improvement. I think that Clay previewed this. If you were at Claris Engage and you went to his session with Lucy Chen, um, he previewed this um, at Claris Engage in Austin as well. And I ask a question for those of you wondering. So, FileMaker, the next version is in, is come is it's in the traffic pattern to land at the airport. It's coming soon. This one I know is in the next release because I've been trying to make sure I can present on it. This one here is are some of these like the next like 2024 like really quick in the next couple of weeks, and some of these are farther out because I didn't remember seeing this one. So, is this? Guys, that's the, can we even mention that, or is that somewhere you want to stay away from? 
No, no. Well, th- the intention is uh, uh, that every single thing that shows in progress is essentially something that we expect to come out in, in the next release. So, um, you know, uh, if this made the very next or if it's the 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 because there's major releases, right? FileMaker 2024 is a major release. Think of it back in the day when you had upgrades. Yep. It was it's the leap from 2023 to 2024. A lot of stuff is bundled together. There's there's quite a bit in this release. But in between those, um, we take an opportunity, we fix in market issues, things that we didn't catch in ETS that come up. Um, and we might pepper in um, things like, for instance, uh, very well that we could get complete compliance with odata 4.0.1 um we wouldn't wait for you know 2025 to, to come out right. um, to do to do that so uh, but the intention is that this this is out um when 2024 comes out okay because because all the so everyone understands the 2024 every release that claris releases this calendar year would be called 2024 it'll just be you know dot one or dot zero dot one dot two whatever however far we get with that over the course of the year so all right, cool. So we got that one. We're down to custom yeah. auth, or we can skip or move or whatever. Yeah, no, we can skip. We can next go down to the Claris FileMaker Cloud section. So two new items, uh, essentially quality of life. One, um, we had a limitation of 99 or 100 um, users for FileMaker Cloud. Uh, and if you needed more than that, then pick up the phone and, and call sales. So we've done some work to bump that number from 99 to 150. Um, so if you do have a need um, to, to, to go larger, um, uh, you, you can do that now and you don't have to go through hoops to do it. And then the second one is rather than having to invite someone to your cloud with a Claris ID one by one by one by one, um, you can now um, invite multiple users simultaneously. So that's obvious um, uh, why that that's that's better. Anyone who has to add, add, add a bunch of uh, individuals. Uh, so uh, both uh, those are coming to the cloud. Now, the thing that you have to understand about um uh, FileMaker Cloud in relation to <clears throat> the rest of the FileMaker platform is there's always about a month delta between when we ship the platform and we ship cloud. And the reason for that is to make sure we catch anything that we weren't able to catch through ETS, because the reality of the ETS or the external testing program that many of you may be involved in is while you're testing individual enhancements and features, it's really very, very hard to fully regress uh, something until it's in production because that's when all the piece parts come together. But we tell you don't put ETS builds in production, right? So it's not until after that some things that just slipped through weren't caught in ETS. And so rather than updating FileMaker Cloud twice, um, we we have that delay to make sure we can pick up these little things that um, we would then um, we would update all of the clients and we'd update cloud at the same time. So that's that, that they're parity. And from then forward, they move, they move forward. So that, <laughs> that's about 30 days or so plus or minus. Yeah, or approximately. Or yeah. All right. Uh, Margaret, do you have questions? I think we haven't taken any questions yet, but probably a good have time. Questions if you want to tackle a couple. Sure. Go. Um, I'm going to do this if people watching. I'm doing this in order of being related to topic before I'm not doing it in order of receiving. So if you're like, man, Margaret didn't a- answer my get my question sent out. It's because uh, regarding the server schedule, new settings, well, the settings we make remain in place if the server schedules are imported to a new server. That is the in- in- intention. Uh, uh, several releases ago, I, I'm not sure everyone realizes it, but um, we did the work to make it a heck of a lot easier to, to move. And so you wouldn't have to redo that that stuff. And I'm not sure if we got 100% of everything, but our intention is to preserve everything you've done so you don't have to recreate it. There you go, Lynn. Next question. How can something get any upvotes if it isn't even on the list? Question. <laughs> how do, okay, right. the, the question is, how do we add stuff to the list, Rick? Typically, these things come directly to me or through another product manager or through our customer issues pages or through the ETS or, you know, I'm in the community every morning um, picking up stuff that, that get things that get raised. Um, you know, I, I, after 24 years, you have a fairly good idea of what are just questions where developers are asking each other about how to do something versus when people are asking for something that it doesn't do. Um, so we just, on an ongoing basis, collect those. So if you're really keen on getting something 
uh, there, you can always send something uh, to me directly. My first name, uh, underscore my last name, as you can probably see here in the thing, at claris.com, we get directly to me. Um, but there's an, a number of ways. Uh, we have a lot of ears listening and feed that stuff. If we were to show you our entire backlog, it would be vast, right? And it's really about strategically, what are we trying to do? What's going on in the world? Things like AI that, you know, begin to take a, a thing. How And then deciding of all the things we could do, what are the few that we should do to move the platform forward? So um, that's, that's the world that I have. Uh, I literally have tens of thousands of feature requests and I've got to curate those. So. Yeah, the high traffic ones. And so it doesn't mean you shouldn't ask because one of the things that we do the same thing at RCC and Rick does it, if one person asks for one thing, that's kind of a vote. But if, if 10 or 15 or 20 people ask for the same thing, then maybe that's a clue for product managers. Same thing with starting point. Someone says, well, how come it doesn't do this or what's the problem? And if I have three or four people ask for the same thing in a period of time, I'm like, okay, well, maybe we should address that, right? So when is the idea section coming back? I really liked it. There was an idea web page, I guess, Rick, at one point that we pulled down. In the community, I think that's where a couple of people have posted. Yeah, stuff. that uh, I know what you're talking about for sure. As far as the people that took it down, what their intention is putting it back up again. I think you know, go, go to Rosemary and Angie um, yeah, yeah, with that request. Um, yeah, we, you know, I, I, we we would use that as well um, because we could look at the upvoted ideas, right? We could see which historically over time got the most. That was useful information for us. Um, and this really is a different purpose because if you have, I mean, if you maintain the ideas page, then you have a vehicle for exactly what the previous question was of how do I get an idea there that isn't already on this list? Um, uh, and some of those have been there for a while. So, so Rick's saying that product management's not in charge of collecting ideas that the developer relationship group, which is under marketing, which is Angie Wong and Marie uh, Namad, uh, are the one, the keepers of that thing. So we will need to ask them. Does in progress definitely mean that it's coming? With the standard caveat that if you ever saw me do a Claris Engage or a Claris DevCon keynote address that everything I'm about to talk to you, uh, we are working on, and it is our intention that we will deliver that. But until we put it in your hands, there's never a 100% guarantee. So I can tell you this, everything in the in progress um, list that you see on the backlog now, I would expect 99% of it, if not 100, to when FileMaker 2024 goes out the door in a few weeks, that it's in your hands. Um, that's how we're interpreting in progress. So, um, And then backlog is telling you, these are the things teed up that are going to come up after these, and that will just continue to grow as well. So as you can see, since we only started this um, in February, we already had a number of things in play that, you know, a lot of them were already done and had been in ETS for a while. So all of a sudden they just appeared. Um, but going forward, you'll just see um, the progress begin to grow over time in a release as more and more things get into the ETS where we have some, you know, um, let's just say by the time something gets an ETS and people are testing it, we have a fairly good idea that is likely to ship. Very seldom do we ever rip something out, but we would if it if it wasn't quite quite ready. Um, and then, and then, and then, so the so the backlog will then become the in progress, and then we'll just keep going on. The stuff that was in progress that now shipped will be in the ship, and that lot list will be at the bottom, and it'll just get longer and longer and longer um, until maybe we decide some point so long just to truncate it at a couple of releases. Yeah, I can see that. So, yeah, so there's essentially three statuses. There's it's coming in the future, we think, which is the backlog. There's in progress, which they either have built or or, or are building right now that will go in theoretically the next release. And then there's the things that have already shipped that are completed. So really three as a database person, Margaret, right? Like yourself, there's three. These record. These are all records in a database, I'm sure, somewhere maybe. And they, uh, they have three possible statuses, right? And as they... The life cycle of this idea or this this record as it moves along in here it can be, go from from in future to we're working on it now to we've already delivered it right so and but it's not in concrete could be pulled because who knows what but that's a pretty you know ninety nine percent or whatever ninety percent I would probably put it ninety percent make sure it all comes out 
other things that you've done, Rick, other changes in here? Should we scroll down? Yeah, yeah, no. So in this section that you're highlighting, um, section eight, the native web application development, which is AKA Claris um, Studio, none of these items are new, but what is new is we took another crack at the description underneath each one of those, um, because as we realized that, put an eye on, well, not everyone is equally familiar with what we've been doing with Claris Studio. Some people are deeply read in, like Rich and others who've been playing with it. Others have only heard about it or maybe not even heard about it at all. So we wanted to give a little bit more explanation so that if you weren't very familiar with, with Claire's studio, at least you'd have some idea uh, of what that's talking about. So it's probably not worth going in here because they're all the same. It's just we're, we're trying to do uh, better better wording. Um, but um, we have intentions, obviously, um, with Claris Studio, that one of the things without having someone have to have a Claris ID that you could publish a web form out of Claris Studio anonymously to unnamed users uh, to do things like data collection or, or, or presenting data. Um, and you wouldn't have the heavy handedness of um, something like, um, you know, um, the Claris ID. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and so think of it as an easier way to do custom web publishing with a, a, a GUI tool that's quite powerful. Uh, and then that's support... Helpful. Yeah, and then support for frames. Is anyone familiar with with how you use frames on, on, on a website? Um, because of the way that we build sections and views in Studio, we can mix and match those together and, and create things like dashboards or very you know useful things like you know, if you wanted to cobble together a combination of you know a you know your your, your table view and a Kanban and and you know uh, a, a timeline um, that you could put those on a single interface regardless of where that data was coming from or the ability um, to um, support related fields and calculations because a lot of the power comes from, you know, this data is related to that data and I want to query it. Um, so Studio's um, adding some more power there and then um, doing some work for international date and time fields, giving more control. So depending upon where you're deploying, your end users get what they expect based on the systems they're using. Um, so th those are the things um, that we added. Now, now Rich, um, we have um, three new sections that didn't exist that I, I added as well uh, coming after this. And the first one is app creation. Um, and um, this one I didn't add last time, but you know I went back and I thought about it and it's like, oh, it's probably worth calling out. And this is now the ability in FileMaker Pro on, on the Mac side to configure for local um, um, notifications. We've had that in FileMaker Go. Now we have parity in FileMaker Pro. Um, for that, um, and um, there's a script step um, for display, uh, displaying the notification alerts, and it's pretty handy because it doesn't require FileMaker to be um, in, in in the foreground in order to display notifications. The app doesn't have to be running, um, and um, it can be out of out of sync. So you can set a process in motion. And then you can call that script at the end and then it can send you a notification on your computer or your iPhone for that matter, uh, letting you know that, that um, you know, something has happened and, and you could even then act upon it if you wanted to, to, you know, touch the button and do something with it. So, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, I did training uh, in the, in the go course, we have a go course and I did training on the local notifications there and that was pretty flexible. It was pretty flexible. So that was neat. So having that on pro would be uh, nice. So, yep. Yeah. And next section is new as well. Um, a couple of items under mobile, which is AKA FileMaker Go, if you think about it for the, for the most part. And these are worth calling out because they re, re, remove some limitations or differences between a FileMaker Pro deployed client and a FileMaker Go deployed client in their versatility. The first one is, believe it or not, the only thing we supported in FileMaker Go for import was a, a .fmp12 file. Um, it, but now uh, we remove that limitation. So tab, CSV, merge, heck, even DBF um, are supported um, as well. And um, it also imports uh, supports the encoding types and the import options um, that you're used to on the, on the FileMaker side. Um, so it just opens up the ability to do it more integration with different data types. And then also everyone's familiar with container fields on a FileMaker 
you can throw any binary object in a container field, right? All the way from another filemaker, FMP12 file to any other binary file to PDFs, you know, graph images, text. Um, so we, we didn't have that same capability for container fields in Go. Now Go has parity with that. You can drop any binary object uh, into container field. Um, so yeah. those are two, two additional advancements there. Another new section, um, performance slash FileMaker WebDirect, because both of these are specifically related to, to WebDirect, probably worth calling out in that they will impact performance because we're doing some optimization on CSS. Um, for instance, going through, and if uh, we notice that there are people have um, customized their, their themes over time, but um, there is um, unused CSS in there that's not being used anymore, rather than doing the work to, to do everything in the background with that CSS is not going to be used. Uh, we, we don't send it. We, we do, and so that uh, makes things a little bit qu quicker. Um, and it's sort of related to that is the next one where um, we identify the duplicate CSA st CSS styles. Um, we have reduced the need for multiple repetitions to generate the same styles. So we try to leverage, um, you know, point it to, to what it already is, which CSS is, is good at, so that we improve performance. And really, essentially, the magic of, of, of WebDirect is you're creating your um, application in FileMaker Pro, and we're faithfully rendering it in the browser and all sorts of magic in between is happening. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's like a Rube Goldberg device. It's amazing it even works, but it becomes a very rich web app. However, much of what you see is made possible through CSS. Um, and so a lot of the performance bottlenecks that come out of that is the difference between a native client running on the hardware of a local device to having everything go through the rendering engine of, of, of a browser. Um, so anytime we can optimize CSS, we, we make things more efficient. So me watching you talk about this suddenly occurred to me, we have previously in the training had spent quite a few hours, I mean, hours and hours talking about this concept of, and Margaret and some of the people at RC remember this, it's called custom themes and shared styles. And the idea was that as you applied styling to various objects, you should, the style should have been saved and you're just referencing that style because then it would send less CSS through the connection. You're saying with this option here that, the server somehow is looking to see that they're, hey, this actually is duplicated. And so as a less proficient technical developer is going to see performance in, in pre increases. So say they didn't see my training and they just individually style everything. But if the styles are the same, then it's going to send it once. Am I reading that? That kind of that idea? Yeah. So depending upon how heavily you were impacted by that sort of detritus of you know, stuff left over that was invisible that you really couldn't get at necessarily directly. Um, there was a great session maybe five years ago by Andrew Paulson at one of the um, dev cons where he walked through how all of this worked and how all of it was connected and what the performance um, consequences were for all that. And it's probably archived somewhere super worth looking at. Um, but this is trying to not have to go to an Andrew Paulson under the hood session by, you know, uh, an engineer who created it in order right. to, 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 you know, and then maybe you couldn't even act upon it. So we, we just trying to, to do the, do this work for you. Um, but it does have a relationship um, to, um, uh, so two newly added backlog items uh, as well, um, which if you, if you go down, um, uh, to the, the, the uh, that section right there. Um, and this Sorry. goes, uh, uh, and if Nicholas Hunter is listening, he's probably, you know, <laughs> probably shaking right now, seeing templates because he worked with us for a number of years on templates and they're, they're no, no, nowhere near as easy as they seem to be. However, um, we have two items that we've newly added to the backlog, um, and that's to revisit ha having a broader variety of starter templates. I mean, we've really pretty much reduced it down to six, right? And we've got the the um, add-on tables and that flesh out some of the uh, common things. But the issue we run into here is not you guys, but imagine a new to the FileMaker platform person who's essentially trying to find out, can FileMaker even solve the problems I'm looking for? And a lot of times it really helps to find a use case that you can resonate with, 
um, that you either, you know, you can start with, or at least it's close enough so you can get your head around the possibilities of FileMaker. And then the trick is not making that so complex that they couldn't ever possibly figure out to get from here to there. So getting that balance between powerful enough to be useful to you, but not so powerful to be opaque to what in the heck you did. Uh, and then you just run away going, I, I could. Claris over, huge fights over the years with Claris. In fact, you and I had arguments about this. And so, uh, so the, the idea was that, you know, if Nick, if you let Nick do a starter solution, it starts off beautiful and then it becomes beyond complicated to with SQL into the hood. It's like, oh my God, I don't want to learn SQL to do FileMaker, right? And some of the solutions were built with that and I, I wanted to vomit. And mm -hmm. so uh, even with RCC, with Starting Point, we ran into that. So Starting Point kept growing, growing, and we ended up creating, I ended up forking Starting Point to what I call the light version. And I, I protect it with like a meat cleaver so no one adds crazy stuff. So it's so super simple. Like for super simple, like you and me, Rick would be like totally good right well the interesting thing is this um i've actually run into this and i get it look so for instance we would go to some very talented advanced developers and ask them to create these starter templates for us and tell them here's our philosophy of why we're you know we we want to get beyond the tyranny of the blank slate for someone who's just getting started to they can get a leg up so they can learn it and 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 see something that's familiar with them and some of them would have a really hard time yes. dumbing it down because then they felt that that was their reputation because they would never do it that uh, way, right? Yeah. And, and so it was almost hard to bring themselves to not use a more advanced technique. The problem is when you're first looking at it, stuff, it's certainly not human readable, right? You just don't understand what's going on. So I remember if, yeah. if, if Bill Dorfield, who... Um, Created Lasso, Blue World, you guys may have heard of them. If back in the, uh, gosh, the, the mid-90s, he had not commented the four things that you could do with Lasso that I read and figured out, not being a technologist, how to make them work, how to add da data, how to edit the data you added, how to delete the data you edited, how to search on it. And one by one, I figured that out. But once I knew all four of those things, boom, there wasn't a thing I couldn't do. And that started my entire career, ended up here, right? Um, but so, but people can't look at this stuff and, you know, give them a bunch of, you know, choose your compiled code of, of choice or even JavaScript where you don't know and look at it and people just, you know, or even JSON. It's, it, but then after a while, you become familiar with it. It's human readable once you understand, oh, okay, I get it, right? Um, but all our natural inclination is, it's like, imagine going in at, you know, my age, and so I'm going to learn a foreign language, right? Well, you look at it and go, holy crap, that's hard. It's not easy, <laughs> right? Um, or a musical instrument. When you start with it, you suck terribly. Um, but the more and more you use it, the better and better you get. And I love the analogy of a musical instrument because it's like FileMaker. It's like, when are you done learning a musical instrument? When you're dead. Right? <laughs> you, 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 think, you think Eric Clapton doesn't still get better playing the guitar? Right? No. It's like it's something that it's an art. Right? So you guys are all artists. You, you learn this tool and now you, you make it sing and you get better the rest of your life until you retire or, you know, whatever. So um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so once I've just brought this up, this is the progression of learning. And once again, I spend a lot of time with people here that people are in this spot or people in this spot. I tend to, I used to be over out over here, you and me, Rick, and then our skills in the really advanced into things, yeah, maybe not so good. So maybe we would have to rate ourselves living in this spot, but um, we spend a lot of time training people who are here and how to think about FileMaker and how to logically think about the relation graph and how and we're getting good at it, Rick, to be honest with you, we're getting good at it. But uh, that when you say star solution, man, that's I've had star solutions that were over here and then some that were over here and and everywhere in between. So you, I saw this today before you came on the show and went, we're back to this. Return to the Well, future. we actually have um, – um half a dozen or more starter solutions that we created for the add-ons that were done by iSolution that we never ended up using. And they have in them um, the add-ons as well. And Chris Ippolite has been making them available on his site. So we just went back to him and said, look, Chris, you know, can we pick these up? And he, he said, I'd be thrilled to. So 
the, the only thing we're trying to do here is to get more variety of these things so that there's more things that could resonate with someone to give them a leg up. And then we'll also, of course, put them and make them freely available in, in, in the marketplace as well. In fact, a lot of the starter solutions that we used to have embedded in FileMaker don't exist anymore embedded, but they're still in the marketplace if you wanted to, to get at those. Um, so um, that's what we're trying to get to. But the the one I was alluding to is, is the next one, um, Rich, which is the enhanced themes available for offering solutions. So, you know, we, we may add, um, you know, a, a few more themes that are or more appealing and more modern um, for sure, but also this ability to choose a default theme at the file level um, and then a, a new layout can use the theme from the current um, layout, um, gives the developer a lot more control over how they use themes. Um, um, we, we're looking at adding a, a theme column in the managed lay layout data log so that you can easily see um, what themes um, are associated with that, as well as a new function, which is get theme name. Um, and so why would this make your life better? Well, this will enable you as a developer to have more control over the default theme and then use um, um, when you use um, you're offering your solutions and make it easier to apply themes. Um, and then so, for instance, we introduce new themes. Um, it, it's easier just to, to, to pick them up and, and, and manage them. So I would say, well, part of this is just having some fresher themes and those will always change because they come and go with um you know, with um, styles, if, if you will, of what's considered modern these days. Um, but the ability to have greater control and visibility over themes is probably the bigger part of this in, in, in my mind. My eyes wandered to the next item here. I have to upvote this one immediately. So there we go. Thanks. More custom actions for connector uh, connectors and connect. Yep. There are, and then we can just open it to Q&A. There are two more things under delivered they're never on the list so this missed the list but we actually delivered them so um there's a new section delivered backlog items it actually is delivered items but the backlog should be in parents because these ones weren't even on it um but um there, there are two things that that um we've done so the first one is that you can automate server side tasks with the server admin api um connector with um, Connect and, and, and with the Cloud API as well. And so many of the administrative tasks that you're doing with the admin API or that you would do through the admin tools of, of FileMaker Pro um, uh, on a hosted server on FileMaker Cloud, um, you can now use the FileMaker Admin API connector from Claris Connect to build your automations uh, and integrate with third-party tools as well. So it's just another way of being able to to leverage the automation of the admin API. And the admin API, and if you go to FileMaker, and if your um, advanced tools is turned on and you go into that section, all of the kinds of things that you can do through that advanced menu, like you know creating a clone or you know a, a backup and those kinds of things um, have an API associated with them now. And a lot of people are beginning to use those in their automations. Um, especially they become part of the application lifecycle management of people that are deploying to solution bundle agreements, SBAs, or hosting providers that are doing automation and updates. Um, so it, it's, it's leverageable there as well. And then there's just a what I consider a quality of life improvement is we're providing a way within FileMaker Cloud um, to uh, directly just ask for a download without having to first go through restore and just makes it a lot easier to um, to get at. You can directly download the backup without having to store it and, and it just saves time time and effort, uh, reducing some of the, the friction points um, when you're trying to just get, pull that file down. Cool, cool, cool. Margaret, questions? You're up to bat. Yes. Uh, can we get the frame in frame in FileMaker Pro, please? Question. Okay, so can, let me back up before Rick asks, a, answers that question, because I wanted to. I was going to jump in, but we kind of motored along. So let me back up here on Claire Studio, so everyone understands what this is. This right here is, in, in in essence, is the idea that you have a sub layout within a layout. So if if this was built being built for FileMaker Pro, which it's not, part of what I'm doing with training is try to translate things from in Studio to how they translate, you know, to FileMaker, which we all know. This idea right here, what Claris is working on is the idea that you have a you have a layout, you build a layout, 
But what if you could have sub layouts with different relational dependencies upon those subsections, right? That would be hugely crazy great. And that's what they're building here. They don't call it layout in the layout, but I'm in training, so that's what I would say. So then you understand what this is. This is huge. And of course, the first question that comes through is, how do we get layouts inside of layouts in FileMaker Pro? And the answer, it's really hard, I think, Rick, right? Yeah, you well, know, it's interesting because I, I believe you probably get there through here. And here's why I say that. This has been an age-old thing that people have been asking for, layout and layout or master layout, right? It, it would be huge, especially um, where you're mixing and matching, you know, different contexts. So you could put together a dashboard. You know, the way that Studio was constructed on the new Mongo backend, it makes it much easier to abstract a lot of that away and just provide it to, to the end user or its FileMaker. You got to go through the gyrations possible, but it's very super cumbersome. However, um, this doesn't show up on our backlog yet, but I, I will give a little bit. Uh, we have a very talented FileMaker engineer who has been playing around for the last year and a half, two years of taking what Studio is doing and integrating it directly into FileMaker, not through a web viewer trick, but rendering this stuff. And when you look at it, you're going, oh my God. Um, this is the best of both worlds because the effort of studio, I like to think about it, you know, for as long as I've been around, there's been this debate of, you know, if you know 4D, separation of data from structure, right? Let me replace the UI, but let me leave the back end of the schema alone, right? And for very, very, model, right yeah, various reasons we, we didn't do that because of the way FileMaker is constructed. Um, but um, this... Um, in a way to be able to use more modern tools that, you know, that for instance, resize based on the size of the screen. And, and we live in a world where responsive everything, layout. Responsive. Yeah, responsive layout. So it might be a phone, it might be an iPad, it might be a giant cinema screen. It could be my laptop. Right. And you know, all know the tyranny. If, if I want to give a good user experience, now I've got to freaking create layouts for oh, each yeah. one of those to be appropriate with um, responsive layout, you can get away with that a lot. However, there's also power in FileMaker to be able to control pixel by pixel. There's a lot of people out there still that are producing forms that need to be, they need to control every single pixel yeah. and they want it to still do that. So we'll have to figure out how to do both, how to give you a choice of when I want it to be responsive so I don't have to create five or six layouts and when I want it to be, I control every single pixel. Um, but I have seen a mashup of both studio and pro where you cannot tell that it's not pro and yet it is inheriting. So imagine back in the days when we were doing incredible things in FileMaker back in 85, because we put the web viewer object and the web viewer object could render um, um, Java. And so you had digital fusion that was creating, you know, interfaces and people were doing charting and all that kind of stuff, but it was just a, a trick. It was, you know, um, uh, the web viewer object is a container and people have tricks where, you know, I got a one pixel and I'm using it. So we're trying to look at how do I get access to the engine without having to draw a rectangle on a layout? I want to upvote that immediately. It's not on here. Okay, where can I, who do I have to call to get that? <laughs> we're working on it, but I, I do believe that, you know, a lot of the, the modernization, if you will, and that's a loaded term because we're in a post post-modern world. So if modern ain't old, I don't know what is, but what's the better term, right? Um, but this fresher look and behavior, what people are used to in an app's world, and well, most of that effort is being plowed into studio, but I liken studio to the, the, the um, you know, the, the, the effort to get a man on the moon. And what came oh, yeah. out of Tang, and integrated circuits and handheld calculators, you know, all of these side effects. And so part of the thing is when you're playing in these new areas saying, you know, what, what would we build if we were doing it today? And if we wanted to, you know, get out of the tyranny of having to install on desktops, it was really rich. Um, but then how do you leverage that and pull it back into a product that has been uh, evolving and iterating for 40 years? There's a ton of things in FileMaker, right? And unfortunately, that does so much that it's hard to keep up with the, the the UI. And so it's like the tip of an iceberg. You see this this thing up there and go, oh, that doesn't look like what I'm used to. And yet it's massive power underneath, right? Hidden. Um, and so it's it's tough to sort of bridge both of those worlds. Um, but we try to as, as, as best as possible. 
Well, I'm excited. If, you, if you've if you seen something that you're excited about, that excites me. Because Rick, once again, for those of you who's done our job as a senior developer, if he's excited about it, it must mean there's something to it, which is exciting. Margaret, go. Uh, can we, there's a couple theme questions. Uh, can we get numbering of styles within a theme? Question mark. And then can we get a transfer of style from one theme to another? What I would really request you to do is um, send me an email. R-I-C-K underscore K-A-L-M-A-N at Claris.com. Um, that's the convention here. Send me that those two requests. And if you a little snippet, you don't have to go into great detail about why it is that you would benefit from that, what you're trying to do, that really helps a lot. And then I can I can I can bring that forward. I, I've I've heard those before, but it always helps to collect the I'd like this and here's why. I, I, I think it would be really useful. You know, you look at some of this, I'm saying, okay, here's what we did and here's why it makes your life better, right? It's like that last part. It's like uh, a lot of times there's there's a lot of ways to solve a problem. We try to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish rather than, you know, telling us how to do it. But we're not asking you to, to you know, write a dissertation either. Yeah, but I will tell everyone that if you have a short video or some screenshots or something to explain it, that goes a long ways towards communicating. It really does. Yeah, right. and all that gets captured these days. And you know, we use a Jira, tick, Jira ticketing system. It's got really great comments, and so we we put in something that our engineers pick up, and then I liberally use the comments, and that's where we begin to put in. Um, we increment. Um, we hear more and more people it adds weight to it. So we've heard something from fifty. You know, if you've heard something from fifty customers, it's a big deal, right? Um, because you're only going to hear from a tenth of the people that have the, the issue. So we use that stuff as sort of helping us. Um, but it's the additional details and the use cases in there that give the developer the context of trying to get it to, to meet that particular um, use case. This is kind of an interesting one. I don't know if you recognize what they're talking about. I don't, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. WJ, the coolest FM template we never got to use the server sample project management template. Is this an old school template from like years ago or? That's why I asked the question. I didn't know if it was like a really old template and existed briefly before vanishing. Email. I vaguely remember something like it, but that had, had to have been back in the day. Um, maybe when Terry Barr Wiegand was this server product manager, but uh, I don't remember because it also almost suspiciously reminds me, I remember the PHP side assistant. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. All right. So once again, emails, uh, if you have a question or idea, a thought, uh, yeah. Margaret, next question. Uh, when's the next version of FileMaker coming out? Uh, I think he pretty much painted around the edges on that. He said pretty soon, and would you say a couple weeks or something like that, Rick? Something along those lines. Yeah, we're. Uh, I think he said it best. Is we've already called the tower, and we're trying to land wow. on the runway, and uh, you know, just make yeah. sure we don't run any. But yeah, this it's it's imminent. Uh, we're within a month for sure. Yeah, I would say you're within the trap. For those of you pilots that are within the traffic pattern, they are not necessarily on final approach, which is very Im imminent. That's not, I don't think we're quite there, but close. All right, next uh, question, Margaret. Uh, Rick, are you coming to any conferences later this year? I am talking to, at a number virtually as far as physically. I'm assuming I'll definitely be at the next engage one whenever whenever and wherever that that thing is um but other than that you know we don't plan that far ahead but we do have engineers i know douglas wallace is traveling all over uh europe and canada um especially as we get close to to, to launch and uh i think um you know some of our other product managers are going on as well um i'll be um speaking to um, the Asia Pacific um, developers um, in mid June, and of course we'll be back here um, when we launch um, with with Rich and team for for several days. So. Yep, yep. The plan is to bring with this product. There's so much in this next release that we're going to be doing multiple days of live streams that cover all the topics. In fact, we're trying to get all that lined up right now. So, um, all right, next question, Margaret, because we are about yeah, out of time. We're about we're about out of time. There's a lot of support for, for studio things in FileMaker Pro. People are excited about that. Uh, studio is capital S, two small A's, and then capital S again only. So S A A S only. Software as a service. Uh, is there any plan to have a studio to be installable on Prem Rick? Is the question. We have talked about that from the very beginning. I think what we would do is first land 
what we're trying to, you know, to put in your hands um, before we you know, do, do the work. Um, but it's, it's, it's possible. Um, you know, it's very interesting to try to figure out how to mix and match it. You know, you think of the Claris platform is what you've come to know as all that FileMaker does in that entire platform with Connect grafted in and now Studio grafted in, but two of them are web properties, that they're SaaS, right? And one may or may not be depending upon how it is you're deploying. And then how do you bring together in one cohesive delivery of, of a package to your customers? It's, uh, we still gotta figure all that out, right? Because the, the work that remains to be done, assuming that we land the robustness of, of, of um, Connect and we continue to work out some of the kinks in, in um, I mean, uh, robustness of Studio and work out some of the kinks in, in Connect is they're still going to come across as three disparate pieces, you know, with their each one with their own admin council, right? You might have a server admin council, a cloud admin council, a studio admin council, a connect admin council. And so a Claris platform is one place to go regardless of the piece parts that you're using that has a familiar way to interact with them, not having to jump from place to place to place, right? So, so in that world, imagine the most difficult part would be once you have nailed the cloud properties, how do you graft in FileMaker, which has 40 years of mature IDE building capability into this whole other way of building, right? So probably the better way of saying is, is maybe we've created a, a far better and more powerful way to do custom web publishing that doesn't require you to literally sling code and do custom web publishing or PHP or RESTful API. Um, it's graphical. Um, but it has a tremendous amount of power. So we've got a ways to go there, but that's the vision that we have. We're working on that right now is if you're new to our platform, how do you understand what it is we're offering you? Where is the center of gravity of the platform? My contention is it's going to be through how you roll up on it, through the consoles, right? Um, and then you get to whatever you have access to. Um, right, perfect. And I put the graphic on screen here. This is the graphic that Claris is still running with. This is the internal facing solution idea, the file the historic filemaker side versus the public facing component, you know, which has super scalability and so this is kind of, you know, where is the center of gravity in here? It depends on the user and what you're up to. So, all right. Well, any other uh, salient questions, Margaret, before we land this airplane? No, I think we're good. I think people are expecting us to be good, so I don't see any last oh. questions hanging out anywhere. Cool. Yeah. And so if you have questions, comments, you have an idea that really that you think the community would just has to have and you want to have a screenshot or short video or some sort of description or something, send an email to Rick Kalman, Rick, R-I-C-K underscore K-A-L-M-A-N at Claris.com. He will triage that and either respond or probably forward off to the appropriate people. And uh, for myself, I want to say thank you, Rick, for coming and, and giving us an update. And we will be also seeing you pretty soon again for when we ship 2024, right? Or when you ship. Yep. yep, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Rich. I appreciate it. I'm going to stop sharing, Margaret. And yeah, uh, thank you for running the live stream. Yep. Everyone. Bye-bye. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.